and welcome to Coffee and Geography, where my guests and I geek out about the world and everything on it, discovering that we are all geographers in some way, shape or form. I am your host, Kit, and my pronouns are they, them or she, her. So settle down with a brew, hit that subscribe or follow button and enjoy the listen. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody, and welcome back to Coffee and Geography. And yes, I just said it just before I press record. I've been waiting to get hold of this person for ages. Someone who's known me for, I'm sorry to say it, Jenny, 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was a little baby university student and I was one of her students, Professor Jenny Barkley, how are you today? I'm good. It's really nice to talk to you, Kit. Uh, and it's always been a pleasure to keep up with you over these uh, decades. <laughs> oh, I know, seriously. And uh, a little bit of a tangent just before we start, of course. And you know how this feels. As like, And we have many teachers and, and academics and educators listening. What, How precious this is when you're able to keep in touch with your ex-charges, with your ex-students and things like that. And, how, and then vice versa, how to keep in touch with your ex-lecturers and teachers. It's such an amazing part of the job. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because you always appear really busy, but actually it's such a joy. And that's that's a tricky thing to impart is how kind of it's kind of some of the best parts of your job, isn't it? It is. And folks, it's like what what's amazing is that um, and J- Jenny's right. It's such a such a busy job. But Jenny, you've you've always managed to squeeze time for me. Like whether whether it was I was a student or whether I just dropped by unexpectedly to your office and say, oh, I was just in the neighbourhood. So uh, thank you for for that. And uh, it's something I always uh, treasure as well. It's part of the working relationship too. <laughs> right. So with that soppiness out of the way, let's um let's uh, introduce you actually. Right. So Jenny is a volcanologist who's interested in anything, weather, history, people, inequalities, fancy scientific sensors, communication, as long as it's got something to do with volcanoes. Jenny likes to apply this expertise to the reduction of disaster risk in volcanic settings. At the moment, she's working on projects that look at how we make sense of the challenges, contradictions and uncertainties that happens when volcanoes erupt, focusing on how we can really learn lessons from past eruptive crises. It's such a fascinating topic. Um, Where do we start? I mean, I suppose, have you always had this passion for volcanoes, Jenny, since you were little? Yeah, uh, so I guess um, a passion for the natural world for absolute sure. And mm. uh, it's bizarre, isn't it, when that passion kind of spills over into the destructive elements. I would say that's <laughs> something. My mum handed me over a few years ago a nature project I did when I was nine called The Violent Earth. So instead of sort of butterflies and insects and things like that, it was all about earthquakes and stuff. I love that. And- so yeah and um i think in terms of kind of people you encounter it's always a real pleasure when you encounter kids who are on a similar journey right Mm. (laughs) and um as as you were and some of my listeners are aware is that my eldest is um eight going on nine now so same age and i see the same kind of things like at the moment doing some things that you think wow okay that's that's different for an eight or nine year old like wanting to play chess is one thing um doing dot to dot this is doing a thousand dots dot to dots not of marvel characters not of minecraft of landmarks around the world like i mean that's just i love it and then then theo comes up to me and goes do you know what this is not this is i'm like um oh that's the hoover dam or that's st petersburg cathedral or something you know so <laughs> That's great. I mean, I guess one of the things that uh, as I've kind of gone on in my research career, obviously the caveat for me is it's got to be volcanic. It's but I have so much respect for other disciplines, you know, that are not necessarily scientific, the humanities, the social sciences. So people who've got a real interest in that. And I have to say both of my kids are very much that's where their interest lies is in the humanities, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I've learned a lot from them now too as they get older. Yeah. And we're, we're both preaching to the sort of the converted and the, and the choir with the target audience really here but but we know that the that the discipline that we work in is so intersectional and so interdisciplinary mm-hmm. so yeah. and like like you as you said in your intro you know weather history people inequalities sensors you know te- telemetry communication all that kind of stuff you know you can't really be a volcanologist without having an pre at least an appreciation of all of those things yeah so. I, th- I think that's true i mean i think if we were able to put our finger on write an equation point to 
that volcano is going to erupt then with this impact, this size, and it will stop at this time, then sure, we could just all focus on the science, but it's so important that we think about a variety of other things because what we're really dealing with is a range of possibilities, uncertainties, mm. and all of these really kind of require those sort of broad spectrum of approaches that uh, people learn through geography. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously we'll, we'll come back a bit more to this a bit later, but before we uh, get cracky with the with the meat of the discussion um i usually ask my guests what um, what they're drinking what brew do they have with you what brew do you have with you um do you have a brew with you or if you don't uh, what do yeah, you usually I've drink black coffee black. <laughs> so i'm exactly coffee central for this black. coffee and geography <laughs> nothing more nothing different <laughs> do you pick up any black coffee as long as it tastes like like fuel or do you uh do you go for a particular it's okay uh, to name brands here because we like to claim that we like to test their sustainability claims so so, so one, of, one of my many kind of fantasy ideas is actually to set up a brand that kind of explicitly sells coffee beans grown in and around the slopes of volcanoes there are <laughs> okay, a few yes. there are a few uh, one of the big brands is hot lava java of course um, oh, but it's actually to java. try and set up some kind of environmental justice type situation so if any if there's any coffee makers out there who, who tune into this for the coffee part uh, i'm very interested in that um so Ooh. yeah I, i'm shameless i will tend to buy things if it's got a volcano in the front in terms of coffee <laughs> <laughs> sales sales technique everybody sales technique um so yeah i mean so i'm going to tag a few in when i do the promotion for this episode and we'll see what we get you never know we might we might cast the net you know you never know <laughs> um excellent right so i'm going to take a different approach with the whole your location kind of um chat because um we've had a number of guests from norwich already um because obviously I, you know, I'm based in the area as well, so it's quite easy to, to drag friends into this and say what they're what they're getting up to. So um, let's see. Yeah, let's approach this this way. So I know you've been in, in Norwich for a long, long time, but uh, yeah. So you're up from Scotland. Um, there's this strange thing about Scottish people coming down and invading Norwich. I think it's about time. You know, we're getting our comeuppance down here in the south. Um, and then, but you've also travelled many places around the world as part of your job so here's my link so we know that scotland is you know an ancient volcanic landscape um but you've also been to places where the volcanoes are very very active so with regards to where you've lived and the places you have visited can you is there any part of any of these locations which which make your identity as Jenny Barclay, the person, or Jenny Barclay, the volcanologist. What what places around the world really speaks to the in essence of your core being? So obviously, um, I strongly identify as Scottish. So that's despite the fact I've been living in Norwich since nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> yeah, even the dog is called Hamish. So, um, and I think. I think that kind of uh, love of landscape is um, something that is very much part of my childhood. So I grew up near a uh, old Devonian volcano called Tinto, Tinto Hill in South Lanarkshire, and just really enjoyed being in that landscape. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting through my research career and places has been that I always identified myself as a kind of cold northern sort of landscape person and that hot steamy landscapes weren't for me those were the sort of beach dwelling types who liked those and and um my research career focused in the caribbean and also in south america has completely upended that i'm a huge fan of um the tropical mountain environment as well it's just absolutely mm. astonishing it's such a privilege to be able to kind of go and, and visit those landscapes in and around there yeah so yeah so i would say both those things the cold northern landscapes and then the tropical mountains now yeah, and one place that you do have quite a strong connection to, which is very, very familiar, particularly with uh, high school educators, geography educators, is is Montserrat. Yeah, I first went out there in uh, 1996. I'd just finished my PhD. I'm quite old. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, I had an opportunity to kind of work on some of the rocks because Montserrat, of course, the Sufria Hills volcano hadn't erupted in historical memory. And so we had to do some very rapid science to try and kind of understand uh, the typical behaviour and where we thought the melt systems were. So it was quite a, 
a physical project, but as part of that, I also went and helped at the Volcano Observatory. And I think that was absolutely transformative for me, that experience in terms of understanding some of the challenges of volcano science out with that kind of academic context. It, it, it mm. turned the way of thinking uh, completely around and also thinking about collaborations. And I guess one of the things I've also been thinking about more recently is that kind of legacy of obviously Montserrat's a British Overseas Territory. Yes. Uh, there's a long legacy uh, of um, vulnerabilities, really, which are a consequence of um, our influence in that area. Yeah, um, and there's been a lot of talk, and I strongly recommend folks that if you if you haven't listened to many episodes of Coffee and Drug for Net, we've had some fantastic discussions, you know, regarding colonization, decolonizing things, and and um, one of my one of my I wouldn't say I mean I love every conversation. But one of my favourite conversations with this topic, I think, was with. Um, Keston Perry, who who had talked about because um, he's from Haiti. Um, no, sorry, he's not from Haiti. He's from Trinidad and Tobago, and his his focus is Haiti, and particularly how colonisation there has really disrupted the um, the potential for those people to be resilient to changes in the environment and changes due to climate change, and how actually his argument is that the colonisation, um, you know, the European colonisation is actually the start of climate mm-hmm. change, um, mm-hmm. not not the industrial revolution, which was fascinating to say, um, yeah. or, you know, the, the logging of, of the Haitian forests, you know, Absolutely. is a key thing. Absolutely. So, yeah. And it's true even when you think about volcanic hazards in that region too, because it's that change in uh, land use and the patterns of land occupancy. So where people live relative to the different hazards, who gets to live in the safe land, who gets to live mm. in marginalized land, all of these have, have their have their roots there. So yeah, yeah, I would concur with that. Which is why I'm um, I'm a, a, crit, a, crit, a critic or a critiquer of claims of prisoners of geography as that being like the fundamental reason why development you know disparities exist i don't think that's the case i think you know you become a prisoner of geography because of other influences Mm -hmm. such as colonialism you know because we obviously thrived as a human race beforehand and we we were not prisoners of our geography because we lived with the geography and we thrived as a you know in our own cultures because you know within the geography we became prison of geography when we started putting in barriers laws um rule in and all that kind of stuff so and the haiti and the caribbean i think for me is a prime example of of that yeah yeah and there, there's some fascinating accounts from sort of early records in the caribbean of people encountering the indigenous populations before mm. they uh, might, might pushed them into marginalized land talking about that kind of really uh, good knowledge that they had, for example, of the hurricanes, yeah. hurricane season, and hurricane, you know, where where they occupied the land as a result of that. So, yeah, I think one of the things in terms of looking positively towards, you know, how we combat changing climate, kind of looking to and respecting some of these indigenous ways of uh, using and knowing the land is is going to be at the core of some of the solutions that we find. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Gonna come back to Sue Freer Heels because I'm gonna show Jenny something on the screen and then she's gonna explain what this is all is. What's this? <laughs> so this is a volcano's top trumps card on the yes. uh, Sue Freer Hills. <laughs> yeah. So I have my own set of volcano top trumps cards. So what so why should we have lots of teachers and kids? Why should they get a pack of these and what, what was your intention to with these? So oh, and then we'll play a quick really- little game of them when when they're that's a really good question. Well, it relates a little bit to some of the kind of really rounded sort of issues that you have around um, volcanic mm. hazards. So in terms of thinking about uh, volcanic hazards, you, of course, will all know that there are many different types of volcanoes around the world. They occur in lots of different types of settings. They can do lots of different types of things. And so our aim with the Volcanoes Top Trumps cards was to try and make the embedding of that kind of knowledge in a fun So we had to pick 
30 volcanoes. We tried to pick 30 um, from around the world with a wide variety of different types of mm -hmm. behavior and variants. And we spent a long time uh, having little arguments about the categories, um, <laughs> thinking about it. And it was it was really fun to work with Top Trumps on this because uh, they kind of uh, shaved off some of the dorkier uh, imaginings of uh, us. That's where wow factor comes from. Um, we kind it's of funny how the games manufacturer comes back and gets you to tone it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, the, the wow factor was uh, they said you've got to have something like that. But of course, we reclaimed the dorky high ground by doing this in something called a paired comparison analysis because we couldn't agree on what wow meant. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's got a different way of thinking in the wow way about a volcanic eruption. So do you like shiny lava? Do you Are you impressed by extraordinarily large eruptions? Everyone's kind of different. So in the end, we, yeah. we all had to do a ranking and then we combined the rankings. And actually, our top Trump volcano in that case is, I think, everybody's second favourite wow volcano. <laughs> and, it, and it was top of the overall. So... It's good. And you heard mm. it here. Obviously, very recently, there have been a lot of fairly iconic recent eruptions. Yes. Not uh, too fair St. Vincent, which, much to my chagrin, is not in there, uh, mm. which is one of the Caribbean volcanoes I work on. So we're currently gently trying to persuade Top Trumps to do an update. Yes, I was just about to ask. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Come on, folks, come on, top trumps, right? Now now you've got <laughs> I, I optimistically say we have hundreds and hundreds of listeners, you know, maybe, you know, from all around the world, <laughs> folks, top trumps, come on. Like we're selling it for you. We're selling it for you. Come yeah. on. Do yeah. it. So yeah. I mean, I have to say we found it an extremely helpful thing to do um with um outreach and we've had such yeah. positive feedback from teachers with this as well. And I know uh, top trumps themselves were initially skeptical because we started out writing this letter going like you've got dinosaurs why don't you have volcanoes and they were like we have oh, the dinosaurs one as well <laughs> yeah no one's interested in volcanoes and to be fair to them uh after the sort of initial value of the first pack they've kept they've stuck with it and kept re reissuing it so brilliant oh, in the good. end we may be dorky but we we are right about volcanoes <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah and you say how useful it has been for outreach so one of the one of the things that you helped me with with um, with a school uh here in east anglia of course is that you came on and you talked about your role and they asked you questions about careers in volcanology and things like that and before you came on i did do um you know a bit of the top trumps with them to kind of get them to think about these these kind of things the different ways that volcanoes erupt and why not because th that was the lesson folks the lesson was you know the different types of volcanic eruptions the different types of you know volcanoes themselves and you know what plate yeah. margins bring them about the kind of lava that they generate and the volcanic top trumps is just perfect for that and a good way to to get into that um right yeah. okay i'm going to put krakatoa aside because that's the top trump everybody if you're wondering what it was krakatoa <laughs> explosivity v uh, vei right the index six yeah. height of 800 813 deadliness a thousand i guess that's the top that's the top deadliness i think uh yeah. wow factor 66 unpredictability 33 and devastation potential 50 and the top trump's cards come with a little uh, key to say what those all are. I'm not going to spoil it because you're going to have to buy a pack to find for yourself. Um, <laughs> and there's an instructions, yeah, and a little map of the subduction zones and where all the volcanoes are located as well. Fantastic. Right, okay. So I'm going to give you a volcano, Jenny, right? And then I'm going to I'm going to pick a, a pick a, a statistic and then tell you what the next volcano is and you can tell me whether it's higher or lower, right? Yeah, okay. Right okay, so first of all, we've got, oh, Mount Etna. Okay, yep. so Mount Etna, I'm going to give you um, the the wow factor of 61. Oh so, my gosh, wow factor. That's such a tenuous category, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I thought I'd start with that. So uh, Tongariro in, in uh, New Zealand, is its wow factor higher or is it lower? I go higher. <gasps> so wow factor Etna 61, wow factor of Tonga, uh, Tongariro 52. Oh, oh no! One, oh well. One nil to kit, right? I blame, okay. my, I blame my co collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> you can, for that you one. can blame Professor Ian Stewart for that one. Yeah. Always blame Ian. Um, right, okay, Mount St. Helens. So, the very famous volcano, which are laterally explosively erupted yeah. in 1980. Um, in August 2000, no, August 1980. Am I right? 
Oh, no, I know it was before no, I was May, born. May, May, May. I was so close. Well, I, I should I should have remembered that. That's the month and the year of my wife's birthday. Uh, um, right. So, okay, let's go for unpredictability. So, uh, Tonga Rio was uh, 34. Is Mount St Helens predictability higher or lower? Unpredictability higher or lower? That's interesting. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some darky explanation for this. They like this in quiz shows, don't they? Where they're like, think of your explanation. So, I know Tonga Rio both has very small explosions and little lava flows, and also large explosions. Um, that, that that's the variation. It's kind of a it's a measure of how different the eruptions it can have are. I mm. think Mount St Helens is capable of having larger explosive eruptions than Tongariro, and both have little weeny ones. So I'm <laughs> gonna go Tongariro higher for. Um, so Tong- Tongariro higher for an unpredictability. Y- no, Mount St Helens. Mount St Helens. Higher. Yeah. Okay. You're correct, yep. So, unpredictability for Tongariro was 34, 62 for Mount St. Helens. Yeah. Right, one more, okay. one more, because there's so many other things I want to talk about. Okay, I'm going to shuffle these then, because the next one was Crater Lake. I want to do something outside the United States now. So, is it, here's, here's a sneaky fact. That was my wow, my, that, that was my top wow volcano, Crater Lake. Being, oh, yeah, with 89. Crater Lake yeah. for being so utterly massive. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad this one came up next, because I get to pronounce it. So um, I think you you know how to pronounce this one, don't you? Ayafialyoko. Yeah, Ayafialyoko. Yeah, so good. There you go, folks. So you need to try and have a go at that one yourself. I'm not going to spell it out. It will take the whole podcast. Um, right. So what have we got? Mount St. Helens. Let's see if we can have something a little bit more tricky. Oh, they're, they're quite different. We'll go, we'll go with height. Okay, so Mount St. Helens height. Um, is it high, is Yolko lower or higher than Mount St. Helens? Lower. Yeah, it's lower by almost a thousand meters. So everything else, like Mount Helen, blew it out of the water. Like, <laughs> so because I've redeemed myself after that initial wobble and wow factor. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. So there you go, folks. Um, volcano top trumps. Uh, you can find it very easy just by searching for it. Um, yeah. And I should say we use we use um, all the the royalties that we get for the sales of it. We use those for projects in and around volcanoes. So. Yes, that's it. So it all goes for a good cause as well. So not only do you get some fun out of it, you get a classroom resource or yeah, yeah. something for you and the kids. It doesn't go into Jenny's yeah. pocket. It goes onto all of those, yeah, those projects, which are very vital. Habit. <laughs> it doesn't go into your, yeah. Well, I don't know. I, th- I think if you invested it in your uh, in your potential venture for sustainable and you know, um, coffee, supporting local communities, that's also a good cause. I would argue. Yeah. <laughs> Hi folks, a chance for you to recharge your brew, but also a polite prod to remind you that it's so easy to support this podcast. Simply liking, sharing, rating and reviewing means that it will get on more people's radar. Also, there are a few links down in the description which may be of mutual benefit. Please do check them out. I'm going to... Yeah, let's stick with volcanoes and play uh, another game. We're going to do barking up the wrong tree, Jenny. I haven't done this. It's the first time this season I've done this, where I'm going to give you two stories and you have to tell me which one is fake and which one is true. And of course, it's going to be volcanic uh, version, right? So I've I found myself two um, articles here. So one of them is about a false story and one of them is about a true story. So this one here, I'm going to go for... Okay, this one from Forbes. Forbes on April the 1st, 2021, this article was from. On the morning of Monday, the f- April 1st, 1974, the residents of Sitka, Alaska noted something strange in the familiar site of Mount Edgecombe, a dormant volcano lo- located at the southern end of Crusoe Island, Alaska. A menacing plume of black smoke was rising from the crater. Concerned residents called the police and firefighters and a Coast Guard commander radioed an ad- the Admiral in Juneau who ordered a chopper to be sent out to investigate. So, And then they decided to evacuate Sitka and most of the residents were evacuated by the Coast Guard by boat as they felt that the roads were going to be unsafe with the eruption. The volcano did not erupt. Um, it was a false alarm and the residents returned and the volcano has remained dormant ever since. Right. So that's the first one. The second one 
is from BBC Future, and that's the 3rd of July 2017, this one. So this one is, it was 10th of October, 1465, the day of the hotly anticipated wedding of King Alfonso II of Naples. He was set to marry the sophisticated Ippolata Maria Sofia, 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 a noblewoman from Milan, in a lavish ceremony. As she entered the city, the crowds gasped, not because of her, but because there was something they'd never seen. The sun had turned a deep azure, plunging the city into an eerie darkness. Rumours began to spread. Was it a solar eclipse? As, and as the early dusk lingered on, others suggested it could be the consequence of the weather. But it was just the beginning of a volcano, uh, which had a huge blast, which itself could be heard up to 2,000 kilometres away and created a tsunami which dev devastated hundreds of kilometres away. In terms of scale, it even surpassed the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora. Oh. So, do we have um, about this eruption that happened 700 years ago and on the day with, of the marriage between King Alfonso II and this uh, Italian noblewoman? Or is it this one of this seemingly dormant volcano where they erupted almost everybody by sea only for it to be a false alarm? So, Wait, so I guess what the story is, you're not worrying about the false alarms, you're worrying about the fact that these are myths or apocryphal stories. Yeah, yeah, so really so happen. one of these is a true story and one of these yeah, is so false. Was Alaska, was there really a false alarm evacuation? Was that beautiful bride had her day sullied by um, a fog? One of the biggest uh, volcanic eruptions of all time. <laughs> so I know there was a very big eruption around... So the date that's in my head is 1437 or 8 uh, for Samalas volcano in Indonesia. Right. And what I know about that, those sort of atmospheric impacts, however, are that it takes quite a few days uh, for us to start seeing those kind of impacts as things kind of travel around the world. And then you have, you know, we, we all remember all the stuff about Mary Shelley and the year without the summer following Tambora. Uh, so that feels like it's not quite right in terms of time. 1465 feels not quite right to me. Um, so I wonder if that's a slight concatenation of several things that have elements of truth in them. Okie dokie. But I've never heard of this false evacuation of uh, places in Alaska either in 1974, but I'm very pleased to report that's a wee bit ahead of my time. So yeah, I, yeah, they, they, they I could be forgiven for not knowing about yeah. that. It could have happened. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. going to say there's elements of vagueness about 1465. Okay. So I really made this challenging for you because <laughs> there's two, there's Ella, there's in, two key bits of information I missed out from both. <laughs> it really would have given it away. Right. So the first one, is so I'll, I'll go for it so the first one is you may not have heard as much about the 10th of october 1465 because the article says here it was the biggest eruption for 700 years but scientists still can't find the volcano responsible so they ah, have okay. evidence that it occurred but they can't find the volcano itself and they're okay. still searching. So, so, so that's why I'm thinking about Samalas because there was quite yeah. a lot of thoughts about that recently as a smoking gun for some of these tephra that happen in the... Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and they do say they, they the date of the eruption is, they think is, is, is they've dated it to between 1420 and 1430. Yeah. And the reason why they said 1426 is because the the, the reports of the people at the time saw that this you know this darkening sky and all this kind of stuff and all this happening so they think well yeah. that's probably when it happened because of the vis the visual accounts at the yeah. time one in alaska this is hilarious right here's <laughs> here's the actual i i omitted the headline of the article it is a forbes article so it's from a reputable um of uh, source one of the greatest April Fool's Day pranks oh, okay, ever yeah, involved yeah. <laughs> in volcanic eruption. And so the bit that I missed out was like when they sent, and I skipped this bit. So when when they sent the, the helicopter up to the volcano, this is what it said. It said, stacked in the cone of the volcano, burning with a greasy flame, was a huge mm -hmm. pile of old tires. And no. spray painted in the snow beside the tires in 50-foot black high letters were the words... April Fool. April Fool. Nice. 
Nice. Yeah, I'd never heard of that evacuation. But also, I have to say that that kind of the tying together of dates and times and things like that, there is, yeah, there's a lot yeah. of uncertainty around there. So I'm cool with yeah. that. I'm cool with my yeah, answer. I'm- and also, it, it just goes to show, really, how you know how much of both an exact and an unex- inexact science volcanology is. You know, you're playing with, <laughs> especially when you go further, further back of time. You can have geogra- geological records which you can carbon date and be pretty precise and things like this. But then you can have something like this where you'd have no clue and you're only going on, you know, vague visual hearsay records of stories. Yeah case this wedding between king alfonso ii and Ippolita maria sofetha no yeah. it's not spanish it's italian so it's probably forza it's just forza it's probably forza yeah, so I, yeah I know uh, yeah so Stanislas, i just googled it there that's 1257 so so that was a wee bit earlier ah. so i was misremembering that day too yeah i think you're i think you're dead right because one of the things that's really important about volcanic eruptions is is when you're thinking about volcanoes is the time the temporal and the spatial scale over which you are interested so in the case of a volcanic crisis or for or for example having your wedding spoiled and um, <laughs> the time scale that you're interested in is typically hours to days when yeah. you're thinking about a volcanic history of a landscape or thinking about impacts on climate for example the time scale over which you're interested interested changes and the resolution of our record um obviously with historical records we've got that hour to hour change record but with the geological which is where i come from to start with looking at that stratigraphic thing you're you're really your temporal resolution goes down but the number of eruptions that you understand goes up because obviously with that variability we were talking about before it's really important for us as volcanologists not just to understand what happened during the eru- last eruption, but to happen to understand the likely range of behaviour that a volcano has. Absolutely, that's exactly why yeah. we had that category in top jumps. Yeah, very well segue. Well done. That's brilliant. I mean, it's yeah, and you, yeah, the, the knowing that geological history or knowing the history of the landscape is so so important. It's like yeah. one of the key things. All right. Okay. One last thing to do before we uh, end up is to talk about you a little bit personally spilling the beans you said uh i love i love this jenny says she is an absolute crybaby so christmas adverts people being knocked out on bake-off anything at all okay <laughs> jenny I'm, I, I have to ask you um i need you to spill the beans on the saddest sob story you possibly are willing to share publicly um, have you, do you have one? If you have many, can you pick one? <laughs> oh my goodness! So, so, um, so, what do you mean? Kind of like in in the vein of me crying about something yeah. to do with Bake Off, or uh, or it do you mean actual... it could be something absolutely ridiculous, and you'd just burst into tears one day? It uh, could absolute be absolute volcanic disaster. Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll we'll avoid the actual incredibly properly sad things. Let's see if I can sure. think of something that's a little bit illustrative of ridiculous crying. Well, while you're um, thinking, I, I'll share one of mine. I've, I have I have mentioned this before. I think is um, there was there was an episode of uh, Star Trek Discovery in season three when um, Adira came out as non-binary rather than uh, like, and wanted to use certain pronouns. And actually I knew the backstory to it because the cat, cause the actor, uh, they were coming out as non-binary as well. And so they took the opportunity to do it both on screen and kind of like together. And it was just like such a lovely moment. And it just hit me right in the feels. And then I was like on the floor. Going, <laughs> so not just, not just, not just for them coming out, but also because of uh, the reaction of the other characters it was like, I'm not she, I'm they. And they were like, okay. And then the next scene, you say, oh, look, they're so tired. And I was just like, oh, my God, I can't do it. So, yeah, there you go. That was one instance of many of me being a crybaby. So I, I definitely um, – so one of my favorite shows to watch is The Great Pottery Throwdown. I love, crea- I love creative things. And the guy there who's really – when people produce a really nice pot- pottery item <laughs> – so I have to say, I do kind of have to, I keep it on the down low, but I do have a little tear when PhD researchers that give of mine give particularly good talks. I really kind of oh. nail it. I just, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I hide it obviously because I dwell in the world of academia. But yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I would say that's it. That's where that's what I can think of, and it's a sort of diffuse memory. I can't think of one in particular, but <laughs> certainly, you know, when when people really, really kind of get it and fly for themselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a cry then. <laughs> oh, Tim, there's, yeah. No, I think there are lots and lots of people listening know that they've had a bit of lump in their throat too when they've seen, you know, a student or someone do really well. And, uh, yeah, but it's just because I know I'm going to make sure that um, – that you're gonna you're gonna share this with all your PhD students, and they're gonna know <laughs> that now that you how deeply you care about how well they're doing, which is completely on on par for you. I, I totally get it. Oh. oh, that's such a nice thing to finish off. All right, okay. Uh, so let's moving moving on now. To save save your embarrassment. We, what we're gonna do is we're finishing off now with uh, we are all geographers, where we link all of our guests together through single words um, and seeing how people have different takes on them. So last week we spoke to uh, Kiko Tomitaka, a wonderful, wonderful educator, teacher up in, who's living in Scotland, but is from Japan. Um, so we had a lovely chat with her and she was given the word Christmas by the, the guest before, by Dan Hong, to do some 30 seconds on. Now, Kiko has actually done something very geographical, but very... Um, specific to where she's from in japan and she had to explain this one to me and i had to look it up but she gave me uh kuroshio now i'll have to translate that for you right uh kuroshio mm -hmm. is uh translates to um the black current or black stream and what this is so i have to tell you what it is in order for you to do your 30 seconds on it right so the kuroshio current is on the west side of the clockwise north pacific ocean gyre so it's this very strong ocean current that pushes past the east coast of Japan. So that's very, so very specific. It's, it's very rare we have something very geographically specific like that. So, um, yeah, it's how you wish to take this, Jenny, for 30 seconds is entirely up to you. I mean, you know, ideally, it's got to be about the Kuroshiro current off the east coast of Japan. But if you kind of segue onto ocean currents in general, we can forgive you. Uh, but I, I think uh, Akiko is probably very interested to hear what you might have to say about that particular part of the world. <laughs> so <laughs> tell me when you're ready. I'll set me timer yeah. for 30 seconds. Don't worry, okay. you, get your own, you get your own back. You get your own back when we're done. So um, remind me geographically of where that is again, the current off which part of Japan? Off the east coast of Japan because it, it is the western part of the North Pacific Gyre. Okay. So, uh, so as it's going around like that, it's coming off okay. south to north off the east coast of Japan. Right. Okay. So timer at the ready. 30 seconds. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Your 30 seconds start now. Okay. So more usually I'm asked to think about the uh, Pacific Ring of Fire, uh -huh. but a Pacific Gyre. Uh, rhymes with that which is good uh, and obviously one of the things that governs it is of course the physics of the difference the thermal differences causing uh, contrasts and movement and that's what we're all about here with volcanology and one of the things that I really love about the environmental sciences more broadly is how you can use physics to link phenomena and understand a whole load so understanding an ocean gyre current um, is just the same as understanding the currents that come up from volcanoes with the hot wet, hot atmosphere hitting the hot volcano hitting the cold atmosphere. Very, very nicely done. Very yeah. nicely done. Ah, oh, yeah. And again, going back to what we're saying about the intersectional, interdisciplinary nature of our topic. Ah, oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, your turn then. So for uh, it's actually going to be really, really lovely. You've got a very good opportunity here because next week, folks, we're going to be hearing from a bunch of students, um, oh, great. which is amazing. A bunch of uh, high school students who are going to talk to us about something really special. No, you're not going to want to miss it. So Jenny's word is going to be tackled by a bunch of high school students. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to change what you were going to go for originally, um, but it's just to let you know who's going to be tackling it. I'm really, really interested to see how they approach it. So what do you think, Jenny? What are you going to give these these students? Because there's going to be a few of them, I might give them 60 seconds between them. Um, well, okay. So originally what I thought I was going to do was try sublime. Okay. Yeah. Well, the sublime is often applied to volcanic phenomena, but it could be also true for many geographic phenomena. So yeah. it's thinking of things as both 
uh, slightly terrifying, but also really amazing and wonderful about the natural world. Uh, so, we can go yeah, with let's stick with slime. Yeah. There we are. So tune in next week, folks, for um, seeing how those students get on with the word sublime. Right then, Jenny, now's your chance to give some shout outs, you know, to your PhD students or anybody else. Um, <laughs> some shout outs um, and also um, how can people uh, follow you or get in contact with you if they want to touch base, see what you're getting on with or they would like to collaborate. So who would like yeah. to? Absolutely wonderful. So those of you locally, uh, come and see us at the Norwich Science Festival. Yes. We're going to be talking about that as soon as the recording switches off. Uh, we love to do outreach. You can find out about us on the UEA Volcano Outreach webpage. Uh, some of the resources and things that we've been talking about today are available there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that is absolutely critical to making advances in this field is your collaborators. So I've got too many to mention because, as I mentioned previously, I'm very old. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to finish by saying uh, science is never an individual endeavor and it really isn't in volcanology. So a massive shout out to all the collaborations and all the kind of joy that comes from working across Aww. disciplines and with many different people, yeah. including, of course, my PhD research. Including your PhD students. <laughs> so you've got, uh, I believe, your Volcano Jenny. That's Jenny with an I on Twitter. Is that right? That's right. Yep, I'm there. I have done my first TikTok last week as well. We were working at the oh. National Museum, so <laughs> we'll see how that pans out. <laughs> I was banned from it by my kids when they were a bit younger, but I'm now unbanned. So, yeah. <laughs> so is that because you're cool again, or is it because they're too old to care? I'm oh. too old to care, I think. <laughs> Uh, no yeah, I, I had a i had a i had a quick little dive into my first ever tiktok it got quite a bit of attention but i'm like uh maybe i'll give it a, i'll see how that goes before i have another go at it but a lot of educators mm. are getting on it now saying actually you know tiktok mm. pretty good so but I, I i will i'll have to get someone on who's a who's an avid tiktok user and actually try and convince me that i should be using it so we'll see well jenny this is absolute delight. I've been wanting to do this with you for absolute ages uh, because I really felt that loads more people needed to know kind of like what you do and your passion for it and why it's important. And so it's been an absolute delight um, to talk to you today for the podcast. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favourite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep geogging.